Okay, um, then let's get started. This is Kai Hamacher. He was yesterday already talking about Bitcoin. Um, today he's talking about resilience towards leaking and why Julian Assange might, wrong, might be wrong. Um, so let's not lose time and get started real quick. One round of applause for Kai, please. Yeah, thank you and good morning from me too. Um, so this talk will basically be concerned with um, the WikiLeaks philosophy, I would like to call it, and kind of an historical account and some work and this is ongoing as you see there's a version on it. I uploaded a, a paper which basically describes um, the research questions that I think need, need to be addressed um, somewhat to, to evaluate or validate, falsify, whatever, some of the theories that Julian Assange wrote some years ago, actually. Um, in the Pentabuff, when you click on it, you have to rename the file. Somehow the PDF extension was lost, and I already got complaints about that. Um, well, anyway. Okay, first let me start with a disclaimer. So this talk will not be about whistleblowing per se. So whistleblowing as a personal decision of someone who might be in an ethical dilemma or you know, something like that. So it's absolutely and only about <coughs> the WikiLeaks philosophy. It's therefore also not about any particular leaks. I mean, there were a lot of them in the press and all the resulting uh, stuff we saw from boycotts and uh, then the reaction of some pseudo-anonymous people that somehow feel that they are entitled to do whatever. Um, it will not be about personal problems um, and between the main actors, uh, which actually asked, uh, prompted me to ask where is this non-emotional responding dude explanation here uh, that got lost, I think, between the major actors. It's also not about uh, legal analysis of what's going on and, you know, between all the different um, <clears throat> states and, and uh, anyway. And it's also not about all the stuff that had, has happened or might have happened or hasn't happened in some European country involving romance and, well, all that stuff. So let me start with an intro. Um, and I'm more or less giving now an historical account as I perceive it. And this is probably the only, or these are the only texts or written evidence of what was driving the establishment of WikiLeaks. This is what I learn from what happened. It might be different and it might have evolved to something completely different these days, but in start, uh, at the start, so in 2006, 2007, I think these two um, texts, with, where, where the later one is basically just the version two of, of this thing, and you can get them from Cryptome, um, it's basically like the founding document, and I think in some block it was already called the Anarchist Manifesto 2.0, um, these, these combined texts, that, that are the, the base of what I would think was the general idea, so to speak, behind WikiLeaks or the establishment of WikiLeaks, whatever, if, whatever it morphed into. Right? So there are some key passages, I think. Um, so this is now a quote, or these are all quotes. Um, and the one says, we must understand the key generative structure of bad governance. And it's always about bad governance and you know, people doing something wrong. And the generative structure is then identified by, or in that quote, we will use connected graphs as a way to apply our spatial reasoning abilities to political relationships. So there are some key terms, right? It's a generative structure, it's a connected graph, and probably political relationships. And that is a graph. And you have some people here, right? There is some leader, there might be a right hand, they interact closely, and there's some lobbyist who inf talks to a politician who ultimately has access to all of our money, and probably that's all about that this guy wants to get hold of. And then there are some people just not really involved, right? Just working there or whatever. So, and, and that is then a connected graph as described by Julian in, in, in these papers, and well, yeah. So people talk to each other, communicate, and it's really a communication theory that is uh, established in these papers. And it goes on. What does a conspiracy compute? It computes the next action of the conspiracy. So 
the, the understanding is that there are people interacting, communicating, and they decide what to do next to achieve whatever goal. And that is not specifies what the goal actually is. And now comes, I think, one of the key passages. It's rather long, but sorry. So the more sec uh, secretive and unjust, whatever unjust here is, an organization, the more leaks induce fear and paranoia in its leadership and planning coterie. This must result in minimization of efficient internal communication mechanism blah, 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 and consequent system-wide cognitive decline resulting in decreased ability to hold onto power on the lighter. Uh, and so on, sorry. <laughs> okay, so meaning... Um, so, if, if I somewhat, you know, provide for leaking or for non-quality communication, so to speak, so reducing the reliability of the communication, especially when it comes to secrecy, then this induces fear, right? There is a tax, as it's written in the text, so you, you increase the cost. It's not as that efficient anymore, that conspiracy. And at the same time, there is also included the notion that some other organizations, which are just, uh, might also be hidden, uh, uh, hit by some damage. But that is acceptable because that damage to that organization is not that large or that bad as to the unjust uh, uh, system or graph or network. Um, so there is some notion of collateral damage here also involved, right? You can really hurt someone or an organization, but it's not that bad because that guy will survive because he's not unjust. Hmm. Okay, if you look into these, these, these underlying mechanisms, that is a showcase of bio, uh, biologism. Uh, and what, what does that, because of what? Well, there is this notion of decreased ability, which would be called in biology a fitness, right? Because this, this whole picture is that over time, this organization evolves from something to something because of this next thing, next in action uh, thinking here. It has some survival value, right? A fitness. If it's not that good in surviving and computing its net next action, then, well, it will cease to exist. And that is actually what, 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 what is really biological thinking here, and it's fitness. And then this next action, um, that is now for the mathematical orientated people, that's actually kind of a Markov chain here, so meaning that the status in the new, so tomorrow, is just depending on the state today, and not on some ancient history. So it's really something that is going on and going on and going on, and has to prove its value from day to day to day. Um, the problem is that with all of this biologism um, is most likely it's not true um, because it's most likely a falsified or well a shortened or an, well, a too simplified model um, to, to just say oh we have a fitness and then the fitter guy will survive and the unfit guy will not survive and that's it. It's basically well it's it's not that bad, but it's kind of, an, of a comic picture of biological complexity that you see here that might also be put forward by some creationists, right? They always un misunderstand what's going on, and that might be true here. Just to again emphasize what the picture is, so you have a conspiracy black, right? You have some normal people, yellow, and then you have a leak that I probably cannot see it. I try to <coughs> symbolize that with a decrease in the coloring here. So with every leak, the connections within the conspiracy get weaker, and with every leak, therefore, you get basically transparency, but at the same time, you decrease the fitness or the value of that network. So now using this and really taking this for granted and you know, evaluating it and saying, well, probably it's true, what would be the effects? So, and now comes a thing that might uh, be hard for somebody here, or for some people here, but cannot avoid it. Uh, those fans of, alternat of the Alternative Laws podcast might have already heard about that approach, although not about the details, but that is modeling complex systems with ordinary differential equations. And while this is numerics, and this is really about numbers, don't take the values themselves for for truth, it's only about tendencies. So something goes up, something goes down from now on. Right? 
So, and what is a leak? Well, a leak might be some kind of a function, right? There's an information transmission, so all the time nothing happens, and then suddenly there is a document or whatever appearing, and that might be uh, the time course of a, link, uh, a leak. Right? Okay, so what happens now? There is a conspiracy, there is a number of people involved in that conspiracy, so Julian Assange is always talking, writing about a conspiracy, um, it might be an unjust system, uh, whatever just or unjust is. So now take x of t, the size of that conspiracy, or its you know, value, growth, whatever, at this particular time, and then there is a growth, right? So whenever it's, it's commanding some resources, it can grow to even acquire more, say, of the wealth of um, the society that it's immersed in or it's just the gross is zero, then it's a static conspiracy, but that would be included. So what is now the dynamics? Well, this is now the ordinary differential equation. Um, and that is the, this is an equation that describes the change of the size of the conspiracy with respect to time. So per time unit, whether it's a week or a day or whatever, there is a, gro uh, there is a change that is just the variable parameter r. And that describes whether the conspiracy is growing, declining or just static over time. And then we have to include somewhat, uh, somehow the, the leak, right? And that is reducing the ability in Julian Assange's uh, thinking, right? So it must be negative here, there's a negative sign. And, well, it must be somewhat proportional to the current size of the conspiracy, right? Because the more the leak induces fear, that is obviously somewhat related to the size, so the number of people uh, participating in the conspiracy. Okay, and these are... Oh, you cannot see that. Oh, the plot is... Okay, so these, this is time and this is the size of the conspiracy and that are, so red and uh, black are just two different starting sizes, so two different conspiracies, and you just see without leaks they are just growing linearly, right? It's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And what you probably can only see in the front rows is here is basically the leak happening and I will just go with the pointer where the line is so it's decreasing but then when the leak vanishes and is over it's just increasing more and more and more and so on. So basically what we see here is these lines here just go parallel to those lines meaning that that leak in this very simple picture is just kind of a delay but it's not really you know shutting the conspiracy down reducing tremendously the number of people participating in it and it's even getting worse when you say that the accumulation of wealth or of influence of capability to conspire uh, grows right because then we have actually the growth is then not only just some number but it's then proportional to the current size. So it's growing and growing faster, which would be called exponential growth in biology. And what you see here is, well, these are the two different conspiracies. They just grow over, si uh, over time. And then here's the leak, and you probably cannot even distinguish the lines. So in this very simple picture of biology or of a community, um, the leak is more or less completely irrelevant. Okay. The problem here is that this is a too simple picture because there is something probably called feedback. Um, a leak might not just induce fear, but think about that. The more you hear about a perceived group of people who can influence all the politicians and the law, the more likely you are to overestimate the size. So that might induce a feedback in society on the perceived on perceiving what's going on, right? At the same time, a, a group of people who's frequently appearing in the media, even in movies, might appear very a, a big, big threat, and you conform to their perceived values, although they are just rather small. And probably in this community, um, the Illuminati um, thing is probably something that goes in that direction, right? So it's perceived to be, but eventually it's probably not that big, uh, even vanished. Okay, so to illustrate this feedback, uh, I just saw that cartoon recently, uh, to make the thing short, so the girl is telling the guy, oh, I love this new technology, this is so great, I would like to experience more technology in the future, so I go 
and get frozen for 30 years, then I will wake up in 30 years and the technology will just you know, be much, much, much better. Turns out <coughs> she wakes up 30 years later and there is no new technology because all the engineers thought the same and were also frozen in. So, and this is feedback, right? Because everybody is perceiving something or believing something and eventually that leads to that what you perceive or predict, predict doesn't appear at all, right? That is a feedback loop, uh, somewhat in a cartoon picture like. Okay, what would be the feedback in, in, a, in a system where leaking is present or where people conspire? Well, um, first of all, this conspiracy can only be a tiny fraction. This is the framework I'm not talking in. So the conspiracy could only be a tiny fraction of the whole society because if it's large enough, right, at least in a democratic state, and I'm leaving out all the funny tyrannies and dictatorships in the world because they are out of question anyway, but just referring to a democracy, whenever the group is large enough, then it doesn't pay to be a conspiracy, right? Found your own party? Sorry? There was a question? Well, I mean, the, yeah, in, in mathematical terms, well, that depends on your perception, right? Is it 51%? Then you are, right, then you have the majority. But probably it's 9% already there. I heard that, especially in Berlin, some conspiracy, so to speak, um, got a lot of votes, so that it obviously pays more to work officially than behind the curtains, right? Okay. So, tiny fraction meaning one out of 10,000 or something, probably, right? That's an estimate. But then, you cannot really rely on the society to enforce your rules, right? Because if you are really working against or parallel or orthogonal to the society, then you cannot go to a judge and say, hey, this guy in our conspiracy didn't confirm to our internal code, because you are a secret. That means you have a huge coordination problem. You have to enforce the rules and you know, adherence to the internal code by some other means than the official ones. And this coordination problem is even worse because from, uh, again, biology, uh, so in that neurobiology uh, and, and, and human biology, we know that people roughly can you know, hold or, or well, keep intact, uh, keep working relations to roughly 150 people. That limits the size of the conspiracy in itself, right? Because either you are a hierarchy, but then it's hard to attack, uh, then it's easy to attack that as a hierarchy in the conspiracy, but when it's more loosely connected, then this number already, you know, sets an upper limit to the number of people participating, because then when you go over that number, you don't have a social relationship, and then you definitely need to have some law enforcement by whatever means. And that means that, is, that alone, the resource constrictions, so um, the, the cognitive restrictions, um, the coordination problem, the problem that we are not talking about conspiracy anymore when it's 51% of society, is already a feedback, although not a, a complete feedback in an active sense, but rather an implicit feedback. So that is actually well known in biology, um, that is called carrying capacity. So how many individuals can survive in an environment? This is the same thing here, right? How many uh, people participating in the conspiracy can survive in society? Uh, when <coughs> there is an upper number, K, of people who could participate. There is again our growth rate, so and this term here is just then the feedback. So the, some, this, this term in parentheses that is the feedback saying, oh, okay, this is now growing too, too large, too fast. It's somewhat declining because it doesn't work out. You are all above uh, what you could coordinate. Okay, what does it lead to? Well, <coughs> our two different conspiracies just converge to the same size, one from below because it started smaller and one from above because it started bigger and it's always going to the same you know, value the same size, that is what's happening. This is already feedback and, well, needs to be taken into account. Okay, now our leaking. Leaking, again, should reduce the growth, right? So it's negative here. 
I just use the same example, so some leak happens. Okay, what happens then? Well, there is another delay here, even it drops below what the, the final value would be, and then it's growing again. Hmm. Well, it doesn't really matter again, right? As in the even more simple picture. So this feedback <coughs> is stable against whatever perturbations, uh, and this is a perturbation. Okay, now you could use these models to probably develop a leaking strategy, because if you have an amount of information, say a number of documents, however you measure the amount of information, is it good to publish it in small pieces or in one large thing, right, to, to hit with a big hammer or with, a, with several small hammers, what is better? Well, so. This is the sum of all the leaks that you do over the full time period is just a constant, right? And it could be something like that. So you publish two thirds somewhere in between and one third at the end, or you publish frequently, periodically, all the time, blah, 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 always a small amount. Does it really change anything? Well, so the question is if I have two different leaking strategies with the same documents, so the same. Uh, some or the same overall amount of information that I can leak, does it really change anything? Well, the bottom line is no. Um, there is a distinction for very small numbers of leaks between odd and even, but in the end it's also, well, kind of stable against that. And it doesn't really depend on how you start your conspiracy at what size. This is now, again, the same picture, but for much, much larger systems and some thousands and ten thousand systems, there is no correlation between whatever you choose for your leaking strategy and the overall effect. So, um, these are correlation measures that give you whether there is a connection between how you leak and what the final effect on the conspiracy might be. It doesn't really depend on the size, um, it doesn't really depend on the time points when you leak, it's just random noise. Right? So, the system, when it has this feedback, is stable against leaking, at that point at least. So, for a short summary in between, so we had the starting idea that there are conspiracies um, that are graphs, but he doesn't really address, so Julian doesn't address the fact whether it's a static graph or an evolving graph. It's definitely time dependent, so the static picture couldn't be true. Um, he claims that the selection, right, so the fitness value, the survival value of conspiracy of just systems is better <clears throat> because they don't rely that heavily, at least, on secrecy. Right? So they are not hit that hard by a leak than an unjust system who needs to, for this coordination problem, for example, who needs to rely on secrecy. And then the damage to, to a just system is kind of a collateral damage. And then I have to ask the question, but who is the person to decide what is acceptable and not, right? He doesn't talk about that. And then there are the resource limits that I described, right? From cognitive stuff, from money probably, whatever. There are bonds um, and that provide for a carrying capacity. We learned already that choosing different strategies in this model, in this very simple model, does have no effect whatsoever. You can publish immediately or frequently small amounts, doesn't really change in the average. Um, yeah, and, and the effect up to now is just, you know, kind of a temporary delay, but it's not really giving big, uh, or has no big impact. But at the same time, the simulations or numerical solutions um, are kind of a framework to evaluate what the security of the system or its uh, stability and robustness is. Okay, now going beyond that simple picture, there's even more feedback, right? So, <clears throat> what people always get, or well, frequently up to always get uh, wrong, is the picture of evolution, uh, and that's why genetic algorithms don't work, um, because evolution is not about a static fitness function, but this whole picture up to now claimed more or less that the fitness function is kind of stable over time. But there is coevolution in nature, and probably there's also coevolution here, right? Because a conspiracy might learn where is the, the whistleblower, so they get rid of him. That is already coevolution. 
There is a feedback in that sense. There are fluctuations. Um, we, we investigated that in some other system already. There is a process called fixation that is closely related to the fluctuations. It might happen, just by chance actually, but it might happen that a small fluctuation leads to a so-called fixation event where one population takes over the other, so the conspiracy gets really hold of society, although it has, in the average, a small fitness value, but just because out of you know, pure luck it could happen. Um, and then there is probably, and we see that, uh, I learned these days, counter strategies. When there is leaking, you could probably exploit leaking to get rid of another conspiracy that is, you know, working for, or get, uh, wanting the same resources that you want, or you could even exploit it to get rid of some person that is undesirable. And these days I, learned, I read some, some story that the DARPA is now funding some research how to do leaking correctly, so to speak, um, to, well, as a kind of a counter strategy. And probably that is what we already see these days. Uh, anyway, okay, so, and then there's another thing. Um, the network size itself is probably not the only feedback value, because if you are about to join a conspiracy or not, then it's not the number of people that is attractive, but it's rather the value that you get from that conspiracy, or the value that you lose when you do not join the conspiracy, right? So you must somehow transfer the, the, the graph, the conspiracy, into a value for every participant or would-be participant. Okay, so in the following I will more or less model all these effects, but not this one, because that is much more complicated. Okay, because feedback and co-evolution is one of the most important concepts in theoretical biology. And that is because, say, a prey is just running faster, or, well, the children of that prey learn to run faster by some evolutionary event of a muscle, a protein in the muscle. So it's running faster, but that changes the fitness of the predator, right? So the, the antelope is running faster, so the children of the lion have to learn to run faster too. But if they run faster too, then it pays for the next, so for the grandchildren, to run even more faster, right? So there is the feedback, and in time you see this going up and down of fitness. And the fitness function is a function of time and not a static objective function as people frequently do in, with genetic algorithm optimization. Okay, what would be the effect in our modeling? So again, we have the change of now the conspiracy I. There are several now, because for coevolution you need at least two, right? There is again our growth, then we have our carrying capacity, that is this, for example, this Dunbar number of 150 um, that you can only coordinate. And then here now is connection of one conspiracy to the one we are modeling here. So if they talk to each other, they could co collaborate, they could compete, or they are probably neutral, right? Whatever. And you just have to sum up all the influences. And that is, that is a model that is good to get into co-evolution, and these are now coupled um, differential equations. And the growth rate is actually a function now of the value of all the conspiracies, right? Is it valuable for me to join that conspiracy? Okay, it gets even more worse because we need this value and there are several ideas how to value or evaluate, quantify the value of a network. There is something that goes like a polynomial in the size, so n is the number of participants in the network, so the value is then roughly n square, right, so it's getting larger and larger. Uh, the larger the network is, so the conspiracy here. Then there is something that tries to assign value to, the, to each individual connection, and that grows then even more, so that is now exponential with some additional terms in the number of participants in the conspiracy. And I will not talk about this much more involved model because there are so many free parameters that are just not known. Um, but basically this guy is, or this is a special case of this guy anyway. Okay, so it's getting more complicated, right? <laughs> Just to tell you that it's really bad here. Because now we include the leaking. And what, how might leaking affect the time evolution of our conspiracies now? 
Well, it might reduce the growth rate, right? So the economic value, say, some leak about a product. You don't get that patent because it's already leaked. Mm. So you cannot grow as a consp conspiring company, uh, say, in, uh, in the music industry or whatever. And then there is another kind of leak that somehow affects the, the interaction between all the different conspiracies and the current one that I'm modeling, right? This is a second term. So these are the two places how leaks might affect the time evolution of the, or the size uh, change of this conspiracy. And uh, well, one leak might actually lead to, two, to the two terms at the same time. It's just different places where leaks might induce effects. And that also is here the counter strategy, right? So every counter strategy that is exploited by XK, so the Kth conspiracy in society, to reduce the effectiveness of conspiracy I is then included here too. Okay, even more impressive, um, but um, this is actually a reduction. I'm now talking only about two conspiracies because it's the smallest amount that I can have um, and that compete with each other, that leak, disfavoring each other, that are immersed in a society, right? So there is the size X of conspiracy one, the size Y of conspiracy two, and then there is the overall society Z, but that is fixed because everybody adds up to, let's say, 80 million in Germany, and that means that this actually three uh, differential equations are just two because by that <coughs> conservation property. Okay, so we now have to integrate these two differential equations. But we have so many unknown parameters. So, and I do not know what the parameters are. And I told you, it's, although it's su supposed to be quantitative, the only thing that you can learn from these models is if you change this up, does this quantity go down, does it go up, or is it you know, not a function of it? That's everything I can do. So, therefore, the only approach to learn something is to just take every parameter possible and look what's happening when I do not know anything about the system, you know, then I have to take everything into account that might happen. So now what I'm doing is I sample over all the parameters in this rather complicated formula, especially about the betas which describe the interaction, either competition or, co or collaboration, and the different R's and, uh, well, the different, the, the amount or the, the impact a leak has. Um, and I'm dis distinguishing between this Reed's law and the Metcalf law on how to evaluate or value a network. But these are many parameters now. This is basically a seven-dimensional space. So you have seven dimensions, as you can easily depict, right, and visualize. And that is a problem, because what I want to show you is that there is a distinguished feature, a signal, but I cannot show you that in seven dimensions. I'm very sorry, but I tried hard. But there is a mathematical thing to, to do at least an approximation to that. And that is called PCA, Principal Component Analysis. And you don't have to understand the details, but the overall idea is you have something in a high dimensional space, say three dimension, and by that method you can map it into a small dimensional space. So we would have our seven dimensional space and we map it into two dimensions. That's a basic idea. I, you can look that method up in Wikipedia and it's probably, it's implemented in basically every uh, numerical package, um, Mathematica, Octave, R, whatever. So this is our seven dimensional space and we reduce it now just to two dimensions for visualization purposes. And the idea is to rotate this huge body that you look at the surface that is the most important one. And what is important, um, that is figured out by that method. Okay, if I simulate now the two conspiracies in that big society, what's happening? Well, that. So, the distinction here between the black and the red dots is <coughs> after this mapping into two dimensions, of this huge uh, data set, right? There were four, millions, uh, four million simulations uh, for each plot here, um, is 
The black dots are the one where one conspiracy got extinct, so it vanished. The other was much more uh, fit to survive and acquired more resources, and the other was extinct in the sense that its number of participants went down to zero. There is no conspiracy more anymore, but there is another one, right? It's only one left. And the red dots are the ones that are no extinct, extinction. So there are two conspiracies, life and kick-in here. And you see that these two things are at least partitionally separated. So in this, there, this tells you that in either method, how to evaluate um, the network value, you get a differentiation. So there are parameters, there are strategies of leaking or impacts of leaking that provide for an extinction and some other that don't provide for extinction. That is the message of that slide. So you can choose somehow a scenario where you get rid of at least one conspiracy. Okay, the problem is already here in that numbers, the, the relative growth of the surviving, if, it, if it's only one surviving conspiracy, um, is a factor of 12 or a factor of 14. Um, indicates that probably the one surviving conspiracy is the one surviving, hey, good news for those guys, but it's even better, they were just much, much bigger as they would be if the other conspiracy would also survive and compete for the same resources. And now you can use the PCA thing, I will not go into details, but you can get really what are the important parameters, and you could see that here, these are the parameters, and this is the, the importance of that parameter for the distinction between the black and the red group of systems, of scenarios. And whenever in absolute value a number here is large that tells you that that parameter was important to distinguish and separate these two scenarios, those are the two results of extinction and no extinction. And it depends slightly on what method you choose to evaluate the, the value of a network, but it's always the interaction between the two conspiracies. So whenever two conspiracies <coughs> collaborate, they, do not got ex they will not get extinct. Okay, not that surprising, but it's the most important effect for extinction or no extinction. So whenever they get into kind of collaboration, their combined survival fitness is much higher. That is the message here. Here, that is the interaction between one conspiracy and the society. Here the picture is not really clear. It depends really on which model you choose. Here, there is no value at all. Here, it might be a small impact. And that would, for example, model the social norms. Is whistleblowing accepted? Is it you know, punished? Or is actually put people whistleblowers to be heroes? That is kind of this value here. Mm, depends. Um, what doesn't have an effect at all is leaking um, in the sense that the, the bigger the conspiracy, the more leaks there are, which you would assume there are more documents, there is more information that could be leaked, there are more potential whistleblowers, but this is not really you know, the important thing. What is important, however, to distinguish extinction and non-extinction is the second parameter, and that is um, the more powerful one of the conspiracies is, the more it could use blackmailing and counter strategy. So using leaking as a strategy to hurt the other conspiracy. And that is important to get rid of the other guy. And it's actually the same, of the same order of magnitude of the collaboration or com uh, com competition between the two, right? So this is, this is important. This guy is probably not important. And what's not important at all is really the starting size of the conspiracies. So they will just grow to whatever carrying capacity. Okay, bottom line, the interaction between con the conspiracies is the most important effect. Society is not that important. The leaking is only important when they do it either in collaboration or as a competition. But that's basically it. Okay. I already told you that the average growth is much higher, and you see that here. So again, black is where you have extinction of one conspiracy, and red is where you have no extinction with the two models of network evaluation. And this is now a histogram, so this is a probability how frequently you find a relative size increase in the two scenarios. 
And you see that, well, the relative size increase is rather small when the two conspiracies survive. Right? Small. But when one conspiracy got extinct, then we already know from the previous slide that the average size increase is 12 or something. And yeah, and this is actually the logarithm here. Um, so the logarithm of the relative growth. And it can get really, really big, 10 to the fifth, right? So really big, up to becoming some party or whatever in society. So you pay a price. You might now think that it's good to have conspiracies that somehow compete and leak and do whatever, but then the one surviving is much bigger and your problem might be much worse, right? Because you got rid of that smaller conspiracy or that not that fit conspiracy, but then the surviving one is a much, much bigger threat because it's bigger and therefore it has more value, more resources, more blah, blah, blah. Okay, that brings me to the interpretation. Um, so, for extinction, we, we learned, for the extinction of one conspiracy, that the competition between them is most important, one of the most important effects, or one of the most important feedbacks. Leaking could be a strategic weapon for one of them to get rid of the other, because they ultimately compete for the same resources, right? Money. And when, we, when I get rid of my competitor, there might be more money for me. And, um, what doesn't really have an effect is, in, in that framework at least, the social norms. Does society, you know, emphasize and, and encourage, motivate, and value the importance of whistleblowers? The psychological effect, so if I perceive conspiracy as to be very powerful, has no effect, because, or not that big an effect. I do not necessarily want to join that. The size of the conspiracy, so you, the good news is if you today conspire to, do, to achieve something, just start with two people, in the end you might grow to something. The drawbacks of this whole leaking scenario, however, is that you might get rid of one conspiracy, that's fine, but you will then pay the price that you're facing a much larger opponent because that guy grew, grew on the resources that were freed by the extinction of the other group. Okay, um, how much time is left? Oh, okay. Because this was now really that, that you have more or less a static society with, you know, fixed norms. What's not included, or fixed laws, what's not included is what happens if, if the rules of the game change. So if you change the leaking scenario or the leaking capabilities of people, what changes when, you know, the the, the legal norms in particular change how people could collaborate or uh, compete. And that brings me to one of my beloved uh, subjects, that is intellectual property, because that is somewhat related also to that stuff, because it has a huge impact on leaking um, for several reasons. And the importance is probably best described in that small quote by Mark Getty, that's actually the guy from this picture company, um, where most of the pictures these days come from. Intellectual property is the all of the 21st century. Right? So everybody is, <coughs> will at least fight over it, and uh, that is the key productive resources, or resource, uh, in the end. And uh, that, that is, that the, the current trend is not that good. Uh, we could have already known uh, in 1949, I cannot emphasize that enough, one guy, well, basically the, the saint of what you probably would call neoliberalism, but what I would call market economy, so the hero, so to speak, already wrote that when it comes to copyright and patents, blah, 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 a slavish application of the concept of property, blah, 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 and that drastic reforms may be required. So that was the guy who was proposing market economy to the extreme, was already writing in 1949, against, basically, the extension of intellectual property. And that is not just an ancient idea, but also a recent uh, thinking, as you can learn in all those nice books. I particularly uh, recommend The Master Switch by Tim Wu, which is explicitly uh, discussing the stuff when it comes to information societies or information industries. 
And you can learn that this information thing, uh, intellectual property thing, is really a big problem. So what is the impact of intellectual property in, in our scenario here, in our framework? So again, I have the growth of our conspiracy, and now think about a conspiracy, in quotation marks, as, say, the music industry and the film industry and the blah, blah, blah industry, right? And then you might leak something that they do. Most of you are aware of ACTA and all the other things that they do, well, whatever. Um, so you might reduce the growth either by economic stuff, by leaking uh, internal documents, I don't know. So what is the effect on those two terms here? You have now competition between different industrial sectors, so there might be an, an internet company that is not favoring some restriction, uh, but there might be the music industry which is favoring that, so you have competition here. Okay, so first of all, several groups, if you would like to regard them as conspiracies, um, share common goals, right? The introduction of all these, well, horror things, um, that, lead that, several, that leads to the fact that several of these collaboration or competition scenarios are actually larger than zero. That is, that is we have co uh, collaboration here. And if you look closely, that means they compete for the same resources, but this, the problem is, we come after that, uh, to that point, that the resources are not that constrained, so the carrying capacity is, is not really existing at that point. So the collaboration exists. There is positive feedback now, and that is a problem, so we don't have any checks and balances in the system anymore. Um, the leaking might be even reduced or hindered at all because I can claim, oh, this document is my intellectual property, so you cannot publish and enforce using these things then to shut down the leaking at all, so probably the terms even vanish, right? Um, and then we see that they basically do that in plain sight, right? It's not really a conspiracy in secrecy. I don't think that they are really hurt by any of the leaks, because they just do it, and they don't give anything about it. So, hmm. the feedback is switched off. There is no feedback in the sense that they try to avoid bad publicity because they control the publicity, right? Um, and then there is something missing in this whole model, and that is important for the carrying capacity. Um, we see an extension of intellectual property all the time, and that means you accumulate value. Up to now, I had only included in the modeling, and that is now basically a research proposal for the future, I've only included the value at present time. So I'm going around, count the numbers of people, and say, oh, everybody is contributing something to my conspiracy, and that is the value. But now I have a stock of patents, of you know, intellectual property, whatever, uh, and that accumulates over time, and it's extended even more and more and more. So it's growing and growing and growing and growing in comparison to everything else, which is just probably static or even declining. So that means in mathematical terms that we can no longer model that as a differential equation, but then this is an integral differential equation, and in particular it will go into the carrying capacity. Because if I extend everything, every protection, I can just grow and grow and grow, not in the number of people, but in the impact on society. So IP is really kind of a meta-strategy to counteract everything which is a control feedback to, you know, have a compet competition to have some feedback that reduces the growth to an absolute control of everything. Okay, to summarize the talk, so I started with Julian Assange's starting idea, which is a very simple picture of biology, that conspiracies are graphs, uh, and they can be attacked, for example, by leaking, and the unjust ones are more relying on secrecy, so they are rooted out more easily or uh, uh, more frequently. Um, yeah, in the average that might be true. The problem is there is feedback. The full dynamics is much more complicated, as you have seen from the feedback loops that induce some stabilization. There was, against in this very simple picture, there was robustness, resilience towards such leaking scenarios. Um, if you want to fight conspiracies, um, then there are costs. Um, if you get rid of one conspiracy, the other is typically much more 
viable and will grow much more. So the old Latin approach of divide and uh, well, divide et impera um, might be you know, a better approach. You have two conspiracies, yeah, but they are much smaller and their combined effect is probably not that bad as long as they fight each other and don't find a framework as, for example, our common interest, like, say, the IP stuff, to share goals and then to collaborate. As long as they compete, that's actually good. Okay, the outlook is that such a framework, extended probably and, and, and fit to some parameters, is good to evaluate strategies or counter-strategies in leaking and the effects of whatever we see in society. And it could be um, good to develop some counter-strategies uh, to cope with the effects on the just systems, whatever just from your point of view is. Okay, that is basically the summary and the outlook of what in the future I would like to address too. And that brings me to my last slide in which, on which I wish you a merry crisis and a happy new fear. Okay, we have a few minutes left for uh, questions. Um, I would ask you to please remain seated until the talk is um, completely over, so not to disturb the question and answer session. Um, if you have questions, please raise your hand and the microphone will come to you. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, you started with a motivation, or you motivated your talk with, with uh, graph theory, and then yeah. throughout your talk, you, you actually considered the conspiracy as a homogeneous group, if I followed your arguments right. So that, um, especially under attack, actually, it's known that uh, groups tend to be, or like graphs, um, networks will be more, or will become more heavy tailed. So, for example, the, the Enron data set, the email data set, if you're aware of that, mm -hmm. so it, that under the attack fr from the legislation, the, the, the communication was more scale-free than before. Um, <clears throat> so, I was wondering if you, if you thought about what will change in your, in your line of arguments uh, considering scale-free or heavy-tailed uh, degree distributions. Well, thanks a lot for that question. It will change the results, All right. but it will not change the criticism I have, because that's even a much more involved feedback loop, right? Um, so we have leaking, if I understood you correctly, so you get a denser connection, people get more or rely much more on each other. That would be included in that model probably, so you have the inhomogeneous connections here, and if you make them time dependent, as you see it here, so you de-evalue or you devalue those connections that you previously had but you devalue those more that were more in the past because you cannot rely on that people that strictly. So that would be in, in such a model to value um, here the, the, the network or the sub-network of the conspiracy itself. The problem is that is then not, that's just not a pra pragmatic uh, approach that would include much more para free parameters and I wouldn't have a sampling space of seven dimensions as I had in this more simple modeling approach, but I would have, I don't know, millions? Because, so how, how many people do you include? Every guy gets, you know, uh, two parameters for every connection he has. And if the, if the conspiracy has n people, then, I don't know, probably there are n square or of order n square of order n many connections and every connection brings me a new parameter, so I would, have, I would have end up at least with some thousand parameters. So I use the most simple thing to illustrate that there, is, there are different effects of leaking and there are different feedbacks. Your feedback is definitely worth exp or in to be investigated, but it's much more complicated and more time consuming. Well, we now have a question from someone who's watching the stream at home. Here is a question uh, in, from the IRC. Uh, how, good, how good is your uh, mathematical, uh, mathematical model? Because from here it looks like to joke about the physicist 
that tried to bet on a horse race by using a model with spherical horse in a wagon. Sorry, I didn't get the last part of the question. Uh, which, which one? The last part of the question. A the horse, something with horse race. Okay, okay. Uh, to bet on a horse race is by using a model with spherical horse in Wacom. What? Spherical? Yeah. At that point, I'm lost. Sorry, I didn't get the question. Well, I think they are just thinking you're trying to approach a very realistic problem with a very abstract, abstract model. Ah, it was a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, it's in the middle of the night, it's 12 or something. <laughs> Sorry, okay, now I got it. Um, again, um, yes and no. So the thing is, it's not good for saying, oh, this conspiracy will grow to the size of 50 or 52 people, no, 23 people, right? Um, but rather, it's good for if I you know, increase, say, the social norm that whistleblowers will be, you know, accepted more frequently than the size of the average conspiracy goes down or something like that. And obviously there is an abstraction here, but there is, this is the approach that is, well, the currently available approach um, to evaluate feedback, basically. This is all about the feedback mechanisms and what their effects, uh, or what the effects of feedback are on the overall system dynamics. You, I'm not claiming that this goes, you know, always, uh, you know, with the time period of two days or whatever. I'm just saying, in the average, this goes up, then this might go down, or if you change this, then this grows, uh, grows, and this vanishes or whatever. So, um, it's not perfect but it's better than just arguing on the level of these basic two simple arguments that you find in the so-called founding documents of WikiLeaks. Um, so it's a more detailed investigation. It's not the overall truth. That's right. Well, time is over. Oh, um, okay. I'm sorry. But, well, yes. I don't know. Maybe you'll stick around and outside yeah. the door and you can ask questions there.